this is what this is about. It's uh, e-health research in the Faculty of Health and Social Work. Um, I'm presenting it, but I'm going to be talking about uh, work of a number of colleagues. Um, you shouldn't be able to hear any music, so I've just turned it off. Um, if you have any technical problems at all, um, please do contact Cito. You should see his email address um, on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, if you can't sort of work it through email, you can always phone him. And on the whole, can we try and keep chat room for chat uh, rather than discussion of uh, technical problems? So the aim of this uh, webinar, which is what the Americans seem to now call it, um, webcast seminar, is to describe some of the sort of past e-health research of my own, and but mostly looking at the current e-health research in our faculty. Um, and one of the reasons for doing this is to try and identify areas for research collaboration, both between um, academics in, in other universities or within our own university or with um, healthcare providers or with other countries. Um, also to look at um, possible postgraduate study, so if anybody is watching who wants to do a PhD or, or a, uh, some other postgraduate research study, um, please do get in touch with either me or the relevant person that we, we talk about. And, and for those people who are, are uh, teaching colleagues, um, you might want to think about how this um, work can be incorporated within what you teach your students. So do feel free to chat as we go through it. Uh, as you, you'll realise, I'm going to be concentrating on the presentation, but plenty of others there in the chat room will be able to respond to your comment or question. And uh, at the end, I'm, I'll, I'll come back and join you again, having a look at the chat room dialogue. But I'll probably respond via this video window, um, seeing, as, um, seeing as I've got it and you haven't. Um, do remember that when you're typing a message, try to um, preface it with something about um, who it's aimed at or who you're applying to. So, you know, Cito, can you tell me this? Or Maged, I disagree with what I said about X, Y, Z, and so on. So, because sometimes um, as you get into the chat room, you know, you get sort of messages in, uh, it's not quite clear sometimes which one you're referring to. So we're going to stick with the one chat room. We do actually have the facility on this um, uh, facility that, that CETO has developed to, to go off into other chat rooms. So that is a possibility if you want to. But I, I would recommend that we all stay in the one, the one chat room for now. So a bit of my own history. Um, as you can tell by, uh, by the grey hair, I've been around a long while. And uh, I started off working in um, this sort of field in sort of the late 70s. Uh, setting up a clinical system for diabetes in Nottingham. Uh, the system ran for 20 years and one aspect of that was that we gave uh, a two-page summary of the record to patients and we've, um, by the time the system finished, more than 10,000 patients have got a copy of their own record. Now, during the early 80s I was looking at studies of the censoring of the record, that is how doctors um, decided which items should go on the record and which shouldn't. Um, I can discuss that later if you're interested. Uh, also, the understanding of the terminology by patients. And it seemed quite clear, really, that people uh, should be able to get some sort of explanation of their medical record. And one aim that we worked at in, in the 80s and the 90s was trying to link health information to the medical record. So um, we developed a, sister, a study with um, Sarah McGee and Tony Headley. Uh, where we developed a, a shared care hypertension booklet for patients in which we started to develop a lay dictionary. And uh, then again, we had uh, touchscreen access to medical records in a general practice in Glasgow in 1990. Um, another thing that uh, we did, because I was couldn't get a lot of money for, for that type of study, actually looking at medical records at that time, we had to try and persuade people that patients could really use computers. So one of the things that we did was to developed touchscreen kiosks. Uh, so in the early 90s um, I had various studies of a, a thing called HealthPoint which was a, a touchscreen kiosk which we put in uh, about 50 or 60 different places. Um, and then later on we moved on to various randomized controlled trials um, trying to get back to the um, different patient groups idea again. So one trial was um, of computerized cognitive behavioral therapy uh, with computer booths cited in a public library. This is one particular 
library in in Glasgow and we also did a randomized control trial in schizophrenia so we had a, a patient education system developed for schizophrenia the, uh, the the picture that you see there on the right hand side is uh, some artwork which was def um, specifically developed for the system um, by people from a mental health uh, art group and in that particular randomized control trial we compared the use of the computer, five sessions with a computer with five sessions on a community psychiatric nurse. Um, another randomized controlled trial was in cancer and this is probably one that I, we followed up um, more recently uh, and in this study we were retesting this hypothesis whether it's useful to try and tailor information according to someone's medical record. Uh, that was a hypothesis at the time that if you take someone's Donald Smith's record and you uh, pr make it the front end to general information about cancer it's better than just giving them information about cancer and I, I know that somebody from uh, I've forgotten your name sorry from Cancer UK is watching today so um, be interested to um, get your views on, on that approach. Um, the randomized controlled trial seemed to show that this approach was was worthwhile and that uh, um, people found the information more useful and they were more likely to use it and more likely to share it with somebody else. And it was the sharing with somebody else that uh, we followed up in a in a subsequent uh, study um, because we we seemed to be um, we the first study generated the hypothesis that sharing information with the carer or the confidant um, helped gain social support and by gaining social support we helped to reduce anxiety. So in this um, second randomized control trial which was just published last year in, in the BMJ um, we looked at the effect of different forms of information produced for cancer patients on their use uh, of the information the social support they got and anxiety um, and some of those findings were were uh, were there again that, that people did use tailored information more often just switching to something else that um, that, that we did back in um, sort of 2000, and this was a study that involved uh, Mark Duman that many of you will, will know, um, as well as the late Sally Tweddle and um, uh, Becky Malt from Great Ormond Street and uh, Mandy Hampshire from Nottingham, and we were looking at uh, the learning needs of clinicians, uh, but also looking at how clinicians might learn from patients. And that's something. You know, that I think we're, we're still trying to look at now in our current research. So we're continuing work on the tailoring of health information and the whole point about tailoring is really trying to make information easier to find and more appropriate to the needs of the user. It's trying to help people find that, that needle in the haystack. And let's go on now to the, the current research then that we're doing. And one study here is um, that of Fiona Cooper. I, I know that Fiona's watching with Julia in the chat room, so you can ask Fiona questions. And Julia is her supervisor along with me and Janet, Janet Richardson. Uh, and Fiona is interested in inf the information needs of both patients, but particularly carers of patients with mesothelioma. Uh, Fiona's just started a three year PhD study, uh, so she's still um, honing and um, working up the research proposal, the details of the research proposal, but it's going to be about tailoring, a tailoring of information for carers uh, and their confidence in their family and it's probably going to be based in, in internet research uh, so that we'll find some way of um, having two different websites, one with tailored information and one with general information. So do ask Fiona about that. Another study uh, that Julia Frost is doing, uh, or trying to do, um, some foolish uh, referees just turned us down for funding but I'm sure we'll get it from somewhere. Um, it's because it's a good study and the proposal that Julia is trying to get started is to look at tailored leaflets for women who've had miscarriage and we're working here with uh, colleagues at the early pregnancy uh, unit at Derriford Hospital, that's the local hospital in Plymouth and the proposal is really to develop the methods to look at the information needs of uh, women and their partners and then move on to some sort of randomized control trial of tailored versus general information so we're hoping to get funding for that soon 
and um, if anybody wants to collaborate with us or sees ways that we can get funding and carry on that study please do let Julia know she's there in the chat room another line of research that that we had is, is this um, this thing here I'm showing is a is a bit of kit which has now been thrown away but uh, when I came to Plymouth in 2002 um, this was the European Space Agency satellite uh, uplink to um, which allowed us to ha broadcast interactive live TV programs and it was a result of having that that we started to develop um, interactive satellite TV programs and we moved from there into this current format that the, the, the format we're using right now of interactive webcasting with a chat room um, but if you look on our website you'll find a number of programs going back um, over the years uh, some of which were de developed and de delivered using the old technology of interactive satellite TV and some of the more modern ones that we're using uh, direct to internet um, webcasting and our good friend Sito uh, who's there um, and this is him looking very smart with his uh, tie and suit on um, has joined us from the Philippines about a year and a half ago and he's been working on a variety of different projects one of which has been the development of this facility that we're using the simultaneous chat room and webcast we started off with just the the video feed that is just this bit that you're seeing here in that corner of the screen uh, and using email but then we felt that people wanted to chat and talk while the webcast was going on we looked at various proprietary solutions such as good mood found that they didn't quite do what we wanted to, them to do and this method has been developed by CETO uh, using various open source software uh, called Ajax. I think if you look at the top of the screen you might see the word Ajax somewhere. And CETO can tell you more about that, um, about the method that we're using at the moment. Moving on now to uh, some uh, current work that we're doing. Uh, we're working and collaborating with uh, Chris Williams and others in Glasgow and using a website called Living Life to the Full. Living Life to the Full is a, uh, a cognitive behavioural therapy website aimed at people with depression or depression and anxiety. And uh, it's a free website. It's been uh, developed using funding from the Scottish office and about some 60, 70 people a day actually register to use it. Um, it's available around the world. It's not just available, obviously, it's not just available to people in Scotland. And um, one of the things that um, people talk about when in computerized cognitive behavioral therapy is the need for support. So in a recent study, um, Paul Farrand, uh, who's senior lecturer in health psychology, um, and I have been working with um, Chris Williams and uh, Rebecca Martinez and other colleagues in Glasgow uh, on, on a study looking at um, chat room support for participants in LLTTF, that's living life to the full. Um, so this is uh, me and Cito and, uh, and Rebecca Martinez and others. And uh, back in August when uh, everybody thinks that people go on, away on holidays in, in, in universities, but no, it doesn't happen, um, we were registering 525 people on living life to the full and inviting them to two chat room support sessions we got 37 consented, 29 booked, and 16 attended. And from that study, we've got um, a measure of different patient preferences for whether they like chat room, whether they like chat room with the video, um, or maybe they want email or other types of support. And we hope that we might publish that soon. I've got a, a final um, webcast chat room with them uh, in, in about a week's time. And really one of the sort of basic things that we're trying to do here is, is this general question about connectedness. Um, I started off talking about tailoring and we heard that, that Fiona and Fiona Cooper and Julia, Julia Frost looking at possible projects to do with tailoring information. Tailored information should lead to information which is more more relevant. That's the asynchronous way of doing things. The synchronous way think, of, of getting that connection, that, that um, relevance, is to think about well does it matter that you can see and hear me would it would it be easier if I was you were just reading these these slides on a on a website or does it really matter that I'm here that I'm live that you know that behind that I'm here and the, 
problem, of course, with this is that you had to book in. You had to come here at one, be at one o'clock our time or whatever time it is in wherever you're watching from. Um, so that has some downside to it. Whereas the asynchronous information you can watch any time. But how best can we combine this synchronous way of doing things, webcasting, uh, chat, video conferencing, maybe, with asynchronous methods? And that's a general area of research that we are interested in uh, pursuing. While I'm talking about uh, mental health, I'll just mention uh, another project with uh, Graham Russell, who's a, a mental health uh, lecturer, uh, Judith Waterfield, who leads our student services for disability, uh, myself and, uh, and Steve Wheeler from the Faculty of Education. And this is to develop and evaluate a portal to support networks and services with students with, with social anxiety. Uh, now move on to some um, some work that's being led mostly by Janet Richardson. J Janet can't be with us in the chat room today, but uh, Matt Breckens uh, is there and he can answer many of the questions. Um, Janet is Professor of Health Services Research and uh, before coming to Plymouth she was involved and she still is involved with a project called the Cameol. This is um, you won't see the letters very well in that small window, but the Cameo project is the Complementary and Alternative Medicines Evidence Online Database. This is a national project, um, and if you put Cameo into the website, I think it's Cameo, oh, it's rccm.org.uk, but if you put Cameo into Google, you'll find it. Um, Cameo is about providing evidence based information to professionals and also the public about complementary medicines. So that's been set up by, by Janet and one of the things they were doing was um, lots and lots of sort of systematic reviews and uh, compiling the information. Now that that work um, really helped us in developing a, a collaboration with um, the Penny Bron Cancer Centre in Bristol and with them we've developed uh, what's called a knowledge transfer partnership. This is a particular form of funding in the in England for those um, those of you who are outside England who don't know, know this, uh, as, well, the UK, sorry. Um, and we have a, a large transfer partnership with them, uh, which funds uh, a three year project looking at various aspects of information use in the organisation, how evidence can inform the development of leaflets and website uh, and information that clients want. Uh, that's just one example of, of the projects that are being used. And we've also had a current project looking at the process to ensure quality leaflets for, for clients and I know that many people from the Patient Information Forum are watching today so it'd be very interesting to hear from you as to how you go about uh, the process that you go through in your organisation to ensure that quality leaflets are available for clients because that's what um, has been happening at the Penny Bron Cancer Centre. Um, the, uh, the One of the studies that we've done and submitted for publication uh, is um, with a lead by Matt Breckens. Matt's on the on the chat room there, so do say hello to Matt. Um, and Matt is our the so-called knowledge transfer partnership associate. He's the person who's employed on this three-year project. And the project that we've just completed, um, it's Matt, myself, Janet, and Jenny Morris, uh, have looked at what evaluation instruments tell us about the quality of complementary medicine information on the internet. Uh, so what we've done there is we've um, Look, Matt has found uh, a whole variety of different instruments according to certain criteria. I found 12 instruments that we've evaluated and we've looked at those 12 instruments on 12 websites uh, to see the consistency about how they rate the different websites. And, and Matt can tell you more about that project if you want to know. Um, so, sorry, I've got, the, I've got these slides. So it's to review available evaluation instruments to assess their performance when used by a researcher to evaluate web websites containing information on complementary medicine and breast cancer. And we're still waiting to hear from the Journal of Medical Internet Research as to whether it's been accepted or not. Just say a word or two about knowledge transfer partnerships, because if we have got people from um, NHS organisations watching, which I think we have, um, or other organisations, um, you might well want to consider um, applying with us for a knowledge transfer partnership to some sort of project within your organization. Knowledge transfer partnerships are a supported form of collaboration between 
an outside organization that is outside the university such as such as an NHS trust uh, or a charity and uh, of course in this case our faculty so in this in the case of the Penny Bron Cancer Center they pay a proportion of the costs and the ESRC via the KTP the knowledge transfer partnership program also pay part of the funding Matt is employed by the university but is based in at Penny Bron in Bristol uh, with joint supervision from from uh, Penny Bron and the university. If you want to know more about that, I don't know if uh, Michael's watching um, or, or Emma or um, anybody else from, I know that somebody from uh, Innovations is watching, but if you want to know more, more about this, you can uh, contact uh, Michael Paisy, who's our faculty management managers, uh, Innovations Manager, or Emma Hewitt. Move on now to uh, another project which is underway at the moment, uh, which is using mobile phones. And uh, in the faculty, uh, we have Fraser Reed. He's the, uh, the top right picture there. Um, Fraser um, has, is a social psychologist, has done some work before with another uh, student called Donna Reed, with no relation, uh, looking at different uses of mobile phones. Uh, and in particular, they found that some young people tended to be texters and some young people tended to be talkers okay there was a a range of differences between the two but um interesting different way that young people use mobile phones and uh, Fraser's done a lot of other work around mobile phones and he's now working with Paul Farrand and they have funding from the NHS research for patient benefit program uh and they're employing um our researcher Ruth Darville, who may be uh, logged in today, uh, in a collaborative study with the Devon Partnership Trust looking at texting to help reduce the repetition of self-harm amongst young people who attend accident emergency. I was quite, um, really quite surprised to find when I, when I first heard about this project and another one I'll tell you in a minute, uh, to find that seven percent 7% of 15-year-olds uh, in the UK have self-harmed at some time or other. Uh, so it's, it's clearly quite a major public health problem. This project is trying to use the sorts of technology that um, young people are, are, are familiar with, mobile phones, um, and to see how we can use texting to try and keep them away from, from self, further self-harm. We have another project on self-harm, this time rather than Paul it's me uh, with Fraser and uh, colleagues from De Devon Partnership Trust. It's led by Christabel Owens who's uh, um, in the Devon Partnership Trust and, and others. And this study is about collaborative learning on the web, the role of online communities in public and professional health education and again we're using self-harm as our uh, the area in which we're working uh, the, the project is funded by a, a new funding source it's called risk uh, which is the research for innovation speculation and creativity I think this was whatever they could do could get a nice acronym but the risk is the uh, key word there is they're looking for new and innovative um, projects which might not get funded elsewhere and they've recently funded seven projects in um, England, of which we're, ours is one. And the, the project is really exploring the paradigm shift. You may remember I talked a bit before about um, this project about patient-led learning. Uh, well, this is about patients and professionals in the same space, if you like. Those of you who come from a public health background, and I know that there are some watching, will know that um, quite often the public health movement really has went away from a simple idea of health education towards health promotion and community development knowing that it's necessary but not necessarily sufficient to inform people you have to actually try and get involved with them try and get into debate with people and this project is really trying to follow in an online way that same paradigm shift of um, information to engagement 
So instead of just providing a good quality web information, what we're trying to do is to look at professional participation in online communities. Um, so in this study, we've got um, three groups where we've got patients, some uh, professionals in one group, young people in another group, and a third group where there will be the two. And we're going to be looking at the interaction between the professionals and the uh, other participants and to see uh, how people share information and what people think about different forms of evidence. Now move on to um, some studies led by Maged Boulos, uh, who's there in the uh, in the chat room. I know uh, Maged uh, moved to Plymouth from Bath um, about a couple of years ago. I think it was now. Um, Maged's very well known for uh, his work in uh, uh, Geograph International Journal of Health Geographics. He's the editor of an online journal. If you put Geographics and Boulos in, you'll you'll get straight there on Google. Um, um, but some of the work he's been doing more recently is around uh, Web2 and a paper that he's um, published uh, very recently and it's been a very popular pa paper is this one. It's the Emerging Web2 Social Software and Enabling Suite of Sociable Technologies in Health and Healthcare Education which is written with uh, Steve Wheeler. Now I know that Maged keeps this paper updated and, and uh, so it's not uh, a one-off paper, there's a, like a current version of it. And if you put Web2 and Bulos into Google, I'm sure you'll find it. Um, if Maget hasn't already given you the the link. Um, so so Maget and, and Steve have reviewed the use of Web2 technologies, and they're also working now in, in one particular sort of aspect of that, which is in this Second Life. Now I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Second Life. Some of us have problems with our first life, but um, many millions of people out there do have a, a second life on the web and this really is about the 3D web this is about um, putting a three-dimensional interface so you have a body in second life and you an avatar and you can walk around or you can actually fly around from place to place and you can interact with people or you can interact with things you can you can get information you can talk to people uh, you can you can play games a lot of what the stuff in Second Life is uh, of a um, sort of amusement pastime activity, but there are is, there is also a, a a big presence from universities, including the University of Plymouth, through Maged's work. Um, the work is also in collaboration with um, people from the USA, and what um, they're doing is exploring different ways of presenting sexual health information and. Uh, engaging people with sexual health education in this second life site so it's a this is a technology leading edge technology work um, and uh, here's a picture of uh, avatars or people behind those avatars obviously attending a seminar uh, on the sexual health uh, second life site so do uh, have a ask Maggot any other questions that you may have about that Another project that Maged's doing is uh, uh, this is with Paul Quarry, who uh, again may be watching today, but he wouldn't give me a picture. Um, uh, this project is called uh, Calix, and it stands for the Complete Ambient Assisted Living Experiment. It's a two-year EC project, it's got eight partners. It's led by Telefonica from Spain, and it's about um, supporting older people uh, through a wearable light device or a garment which is able to measure specific vital signs uh, to detect falls to communicate automatically in real time with the older person's caregiver uh, so that's a, again it's a sort of leading edge um, technology project looking at how these project um, technologies can be used with older people I'm now going to the opera uh, don't worry I'm not going to sing um, opera is a, the name of a particular network that we have it's the older people in rural areas network and um, this is a, 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 a very sort of wide-ranging um, collaborative association um, we have it was started between the universities of Plymouth University of West of England and Bournemouth uh, although we now also include uh, universities of uh, Swansea and Cardiff 
and we have a what's called a, a preparatory network and uh, next week um, Catherine Hennessy uh, who's shown here uh, who's leading this uh, collaboration uh, will be putting in our proposal for a project under the New Dynamics of Aging um, program and we've been doing some work in one aspect of that is to do with e-health um, it's the it's a sixth work package it's the last work package of the of the proposal and this is um, I'm leading it with uh, with Sita Maramba Fraser Reed, Jill Pooler and George Giarchi and in this particular work package we'll be looking at the use of webcasting that is what we're doing now video conferencing and wikis to connect older people and professionals between centres in southwest England uh, Wales and the USA uh, and one of the things that we'll be doing is looking at how they use the, the uh, technology and also how the technology affects um, the ability to gain consensus or uh, people to understand and make use of the views and experiences of people in other regions of the world. I'm now going to move on to uh, student projects. I've already told you a bit about uh, Fiona Cooper and Matt Brecon's um, project. Um, now I'm just going to briefly tell you about another two projects um, because there may be some students watching and um, students may want to, may be thinking, well, what can I do in this sort of area? It sounds it sounds quite interesting. Um, so one project that I'll tell you about is that by Linda Bora. She's just started this project. This is an MSc project, uh, so it's a, a very small small project. Um, but Linda works in the renal unit at the local hospital, Derriford, and uh, patients there do have web access to their own records. And what she's doing is going to be looking at the design of the first stages of the design of an RCT, a randomized controlled trial, to examine the impact on empowerment from giving patients this access. And that's a, a very uh, nice, neat little study, uh, which is going to be really quite exciting, and I'm really looking forward to uh, that continuing. Now, move on to um, Philip Abdul Malik. Uh, Philip is supervised by Maged and, uh, and myself. He's a distant PhD student, so he's based in Ottawa, um, and so we supervise him at a distance. Uh, and he works for the Public Health Agency of Canada in Ottawa. So he's doing his uh, PhD with us part-time, but at a distance. And uh, what Philip's doing is he's interested in um, this, the issues to do with confidentiality, and this is really following up from Maged's uh, reputation in, in um, geographic information systems. But Philip is looking at different mechanisms for maintaining confidentiality while allowing the granular level of data analysis in geographic information systems. Um, the, pr the problem here is that if you have too much information about individuals or the re relationship between one place and another place, you can actually reverse engineer it and work out how, who those people are. So the trick is to try and maintain confidentiality while not losing um, the relationship between the spaces, between the points. Um, now, Philip has been, um, he's so far completed a web-based survey uh, in the UK and Canada and uh, looking at the perceptions of public health professionals on the issue of privacy. And if you want to find out about that, you can go to this website, www.personplacetime.org, um, or you can always email Philip Abdul Malik. Just going to briefly move on now to e-learning research. We've really been talking about e-health research, that is research with with patients, with clients, with users. Um, but of course, we do have quite a bit of research going on uh, in e-learning. I can't go through all of it because we've got too much. But I'm just going to pick out a few examples um, that I think may be of interest. In e-learning research, of course, the main focus is on the students or on professionals. Um, and one such project is the GeneSense project, uh, led by Heather Skirton and uh, including Karen Gresty and others. And this project aimed to provide electronic learning resources on genetics to health professionals, um, both undergraduate and registered. And it developed a, a lifestyle, style, sorry, a life stage approach. Um, 
to locate the materials of use to them. So a bit like, in a way, the uh, the idea of time tailoring that uh, that Fiona Cooper is going to be doing in her study with mesothelioma patients. Um, and in a second phase of gene sense, they um, involve the development of tools to support midwives in the practice setting. I think one of the in interesting examples about this is this is just one example of a resource which could be well used by both professionals and members of the public. And I think we need to think about how we can reuse the resources in that way. Moving on to this project, this is Miriam McMullen. Uh, Miriam is a lecturer in, in our faculty here in the School of Health Professions. Um, at the same time, she's also doing a PhD study uh, where she's looking at um, different ways of e-learning to improve drug calculations. Uh, I was absolutely appalled when uh, I saw some of the information that Miriam uh, produced from her literature review about the uh, the lack of knowledge that um, nurses and many health professionals have in terms of numeracy uh, when we think that they may be prescribing drugs. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, Miriam is addressing that through uh, an e-learning package which she's developed. <coughs> to uh, improve people's self-efficacy and ability to handle drug calculations. And one interesting aspect of it is it's a very very portable package. Um, can be used uh, it's using the PDF formats and uh, can be used both sort of through the internet or on computers, taken away very easily. And uh, she's had uh, completed an RCT that's had um, some interesting results which you can ask Miriam about. I'm not sure if Miriam's in the uh, in the chat room or not. Um, another network that we have uh, is is one on diets. Um, this is the uh, Dietitians Improving the Education and Training Standards. It's a European network and it's a, a thematic na network of 100 partners from 30 European countries. And <coughs> it's um, led by Anne Deloy who's uh, professor of dietetics here in the this is my voice that's going not the not the technology I'm afraid <clears throat> um, led by Professor Anne Deloy and Cito uh, Maramba helps run the the website for this it's 100 partners 30 countries and it includes a whole number of uh, bulletin boards chat rooms and webcasts and so on so if you want to know more about that please do ask Cito I mentioned uh, Heather Skirton a little while ago she's also got another network set up called Eurogene. This is a project to collect learning resources for health professionals on genetics. It's an, another collaboration between different European countries. And, and one of the reasons for setting these up is, is um, it shows in a way some of the things that we might do across um, national borders uh, to work together to develop e-health resources. Um, although these are e-learning resources, um, I'm sure there's plenty of scope for uh, international collaboration. Heather's uh, network is funded under a, uh, a scheme called the E-Content Plus. It's a, a European Parliament funded project. And lastly, in terms of these networks, Janet Richardson, who I mentioned before, is currently um, putting together, uh, working with other uh, government funded internet providers of information about complementary medicine uh, to see how they can look at the similarities and differences and what synergy can be gained between countries by looking at how different countries um, provide evidence-based information on complementary medicine. And so to summarize, um, before we get into sort of just the general chat, uh, what I've tried to do is provide some illustrations of the types of e-health research that's going on in our faculty here in the University of Plymouth. Also some aspects of e-learning research. And what I hope is that if we've got any students watching, they may consider how this work might be useful for them and what sort of projects they might do. Or if there are people watching who want to do PhDs, we'd be very interested in, in registration for PhD, even if you, you're in uh, Australia or New Zealand or wherever you are in the world, we don't care. Um, also, if there's possibility of academic collaboration with this type of research and pro collaboration with providers, both locally and nationally. So providers, by providers I mean also charitable charities and other organisations. We're very interested in working together to see how the type of research which I've been describing today might 
help you in your organization. So the type of things that might be suitable for example for an MSc or a PhD project might be around tailoring or webcasting, uh, projects around web 2 and online communities, peer-to-peer -peer communication, um, things to do with um, patients, clients and the professional. What is evidence and what does evidence mean to those different groups? How do they work together? How do they share information? Um, projects around patient access to records or different forms of communication using mobile phones, texting, emailing, wikis and blogs. Um, but in particular within those themes we're also I think really interested in looking at the impact on health and well-being. Uh, so although we do have some sort of uh, technological front-end work we also have quite a lot of work looking at cost effectiveness, equity um, as well as sort of early adopters versus late adopters. So th these are some ideas that you might have for future research. We're interested in reusing health information. So how can you look at think about having core information which is presented in different ways to different groups or filtering the information, making it specific to a particular audience or a particular individual or particular looking at how you might change information to different countries uh, for patients versus professionals or for patients at different stages of their um, of their career of their disease career if you like to call it that. Uh, so in terms of academic collaborations we are hopefully thinking about uh, looking at international collaborations it may be that for example in your country or in your part of the, this country you have some specific funding streams that you have access to um, but uh, we can perhaps help share our expertise with you uh, in some new collaborative project. And of course we can share infrastructure such as the, the webcasting facility that we're using at the moment and other things such as that. In collaborators with providers, in our work we aim to make a difference so we're very keen to work with the NHS, with charities, other providers, um, particularly using such sources such as the knowledge transfer partnerships and the research for patient benefits as well as the possibility of us um, getting students to do projects with you. So um, I'm going to put the uh, my email back up on the screen again in a minute uh, and in the meantime I'm going to join you in the chat room. So my email is ray.jones at plymouth.ac.uk um, All the other people that I mentioned during this uh, webcast I generally have emails generally of that same format, that is first name dot surname at Plymouth AC UK. I'm going to turn the microphone off just now so I can have a good cough and so I can join, have a look at the chat room to see what's been happening there and I'll come back into this video window in a minute. Hi, it's me again. Um, just, um, it's great to see so many people there in the chat room. Um, be good to know who who you are. Um, I mean, I I I guess that many of you will have come perhaps from the patient information forum. Um, I did believe there were some people joining us from, from the USA. It'd be nice to know who you are and where you're watching from. And um, you know, just maybe try and keep it very brief, obviously, because with so many people, it's going to zap past. But it'd be quite good to know who's watching. And um, as I said, you can always contact us and get more details by email afterwards and uh, we can't, with so many people actually in the chat room, it's going to be difficult to have a very detailed conversation just now but uh, it'd be just nice to know who some of those people are. Um, thanks. <laughs> 